on tonight's show, we're going to be talking missing animals. Now, there's a statistic out there suggesting one in three animals will go missing in their lifetime. That is a lot. Are you prepared for that? Would you know what to do if that happened? As a missing animals investigator, I have more inquiries than I can handle. Animals are going missing, getting lost and stolen all day, every day, globally. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. So don't go anywhere. The Animals Television Show is going to get started in just a moment. Welcome to the Animals Television Show, everyone. We have a little bit of a different show for you tonight. I'm your show host, Romy Bueller, and I have the lovely Mel Groom with me, my mentor, who actually helped me kickstart this show. And she's joining me today because we're going to flip it on its head a little bit. And Mel is going to be interviewing me about missing animals. And it is a subject that is a little close to my heart because I've had a cat stolen, I've had a cat go missing, my parents have had a cat stolen as well, and I work with missing animals uh, quite often. So thank you, Mel, for joining me today. And I'm just going to pass the baton straight over to you. Thank you, Romy. It's my pleasure to be here with you on the show, and I'm so excited for you to be sharing your wonderful work with the world. So what actually was it that got you involved with missing animals how did this start excellent question because um i have looked back on this and wondered how did i even get into this myself but i think when i first started with animal communication uh, around nine years ago which is an intuitive way of connecting and talking to an animal a lot of people would come to me, friends and friends of friends, with their missing animals and say, hey, can you see anything? Can you tell me anything? My cat's gone missing. I don't know where they are. Can you help me? And I would just kind of touch in a little bit here and there with that. And I quite enjoyed it because I come from a background of finding missing things and loving crime thrillers and detective shows and things like that. So I think it was a little bit of an innate love. But I think it was about seven years ago now, there was a dog missing in California and uh, it had been missing for a couple of weeks and and I was contacted by a couple of people to see if I could help them find this dog. She was an absolutely beautiful, that really beautiful blue-grey pit bull uh, terrier and she'd gone missing a couple of weeks beforehand. She was a service dog to a vet and of course everyone was devastated she'd got out she was with a pet sitter and the the pet parents were overseas so even more difficult because they couldn't do anything and so the dog disappeared pretty much into thin air what i found with this dog so just to step back a little bit i guess with how does animal communication work with missing animals i can kind of step inside an animal and become them and see through their eyes and smell through their nose, hear through their ears. So I can firstly just find out whether they're feeling okay and whether they're alive, which is very difficult to determine actually because if an animal is in shock, they can sort of show themselves as being passed when they're not or if an animal has passed they can still show that they're here. So 
uh, and, and they have passed. So determining whether an animal is alive or not is a really difficult thing and it's um, something that I that I struggle with actually. But so we do that, we first check in to see how are you, are you okay if they are alive? And, and then I go into this sort of process of trying to become the dog and feel what's under their feet and smell what's in the area and try and get a little bit of a location. Um, so that's what I was doing with this dog. And when I was connecting with her, I had no real process. I've just gone straight in and gone, okay, well, just show me where you are. And mm. I was getting information that she had been wandering down this street in the middle of um, Santa Monica and that she'd been picked up and there was a man and a woman and a young child involved. Not a nice man, but quite a nice lady and, and daughter. And um, she showed me, you know, some of this, some of these things can be quite traumatic. So for the hypersensitive people out there, just maybe go and make a cup of tea for a second. But she showed me that she was not being fed so well because she was going to be used as a bait dog for dog fights. And this area, there was some illegal dog fighting going on, absolutely horrendous stuff. I don't know how people get away with it, but she was going to be used as the bait so they don't get fed and they have things done to their teeth and whatnot so they're not able to fight back. What I was also getting told here was um, that she was going to get out. I didn't know when. She was going to get out and she was going to be found. So that was a positive thing. That was the other stuff wasn't so good, but that was a positive. So I was in constant communication with these people in the US and there was one weekend I remember I said to them, keep your phones on because this is the weekend she's going to get out. I don't know how it's going to happen. I think maybe the mother or the daughter are going to let her out and she's going to just run, 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 run. And she told me, the dog told me that she's going to say, I'm out, I'm out, I'm out. And when she tells me that, I'll let you know and you can get out there and go and have a look. And so I'd sort of pinpointed an area that I thought, and I was really drawn to that I thought this dog was in this area and um, saw the idea of some buildings with different markings and things on that that she might be around. Long story short, uh, I was really green. I didn't really know how missing animals looked for me because it's, it's different than just a general reading and it's different for everybody. I was faffing around one Sunday and I just hear these words, I'm out, I'm out, I'm out, I'm out, I'm out. And for anyone that is not intuitive or you all are intuitive, but for anyone that's not practising, um, thoughts and information look exactly the same. So I thought that I was just practising. I thought I was just thinking, I'm out, I'm out, I'm out, knowing that I thought that this dog was going to get out this weekend. Very soon after that, I get a message saying, she's out, she's out, she's running and running and running and, and you know, dad's on the job. And they found the dog. The dog is, as far as I'm aware, is still alive and back doing her service work at the vet and that sort of thing. So it was a happy ending, which was nice. Mm. Um, wow. with a little bit of a potentially traumatic start. But that was kind of the start, I think. And then, I don't know, you know, word of mouth happens and then things just carry on and you get involved in it. You're like an um, animal medium. Yeah, a little bit, but I haven't, the medium side is where you speak with past pets. Yes. And I've only, mm. I actually have had one of my own cats go missing um, not for very long, but long enough for me to want to go and look for her. And I used her brother who had passed to help me find her. So uh, mm. you can use, uh, people use um, missing animals as their pet detectiving tool all of the time in this world. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of animal communicators out there looking for missing animals, quite different to um, your regular pet recovery specialist who is more on the ground. This is not on the ground. So you know, I can have people from anywhere in the world asking me for help. Wow. It's not always successful and it's not an easy thing to do. I might have a 30-minute chat with you, but I've done three hours of work to get, you know, some decent information. Yeah. So, yeah. Wow. So what are some of the reasons that you've seen that animals go missing? You did mention before that, you know, what that um, dog was going through. So what are some of the other reasons why they go missing? 
there's a lot of reasons and there's probably one that we don't really want to look at but you know obviously stolen like this one was mm -hmm. um they get trapped they're injured the really unfortunate reality of getting involved in an accident um doors are left open i love tradesmen but tradesmen mm -hmm. are the worst at leaving doors and gates open i've had yes. come home and my two dogs are wandering randomly up the street when some tradies were there but um mm -hmm. you know love fences our two dogs that way from the lawn oh, mowing man left the side gate open but not only did the two dogs go missing my daughter was three years of age actually she was four she was four years of age she toddled off to follow them and she was smart enough to go and knock on someone's door and say can you help me cross the road because my two dogs have just crossed the road and they've got out of the gate oh. but they were gone missing for hours like a good a good a good good hour i think because i'd called the police there was actually seven police cars out looking for her at oh, the time right. and then and then a, and then a lady came and walked her back to the house you know by the time the seven police cars had come to the area but yeah tradesmen have got a lot to answer for and uh, we need to be very vigilant as pet owners or animal owners um to put big signs up saying please shut the gate yes yes and as best you can to actually stay home on those days that they're in your house or your or your yard because um, they mean well, but if they're not, you know, if they don't have animals, then it's mm. perhaps not as important or they're not of not as aware of it or something. But so there's that's always a problem. Holes in fences, um, gates not closing properly and just sort of swinging open themselves. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. pet, sitters, pet sitters is something that is uh, a bit of a problem as well. And um mm. But the story that you just shared first initially, Romy, was nothing to do with any tradesman leaving the gate open. It was their own animal knowing that she was going to be harmed that fleed. So it can well, be that as well. Yes. The animal wasn't being harmed by the pet sitter. The pet okay. sitter, uh, I can't remember now how the dog got out, but the door or the gate was left open at the pet sitter's house and the dog got out and then someone picked the dog up. Right. So, okay. so the dog was stolen, but um, the but maybe the that, dog had the intuition for that to happen, like to be at the place at the right time, so I can escape. Yeah. <laughs> maybe she tuned her into her intuition. Yeah. Oh well, they're smart enough. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The thing Absolutely. that the thing that people don't want to hear is that um, there's something that's happened in the house that the animal is not happy with. And often I see if someone is um, has brought a new partner in and either they don't want to share mm -hmm. mum or dad with the new partner or that, as you know, animals are very sensitive to things that aren't so good as well, um, mm -hmm. they don't like the new partner. So they just take themselves off. And people don't want to, they don't want to really look at that because, for, you know, people love their animals. There's just no way that little Mitzi would take off because of my new boyfriend say uh, but it happens a lot also wow. i've had a cat get into the neighbor's boat under the tarp and the boat's gone off on a jolly little trip to the boat ramp and here's the cat so they inadvertently get into cars and and boats so i don't sense. blame them i'd want to get out and about too not be just stuck in a backyard <laughs> I know. And, you know, if it's warm and cosy and it's dark, yeah. Yeah. So what should people do if their animals do go missing and what should they be aware of if their animal has gone missing and then they find them again? One of the things that um, a lot of people don't like to do is go hunting for their animals. And hunting, I mean by going into the neighbor's property and looking in their cupboards, especially cats. If cats are injured or sick or scared, they will hide in silence. Mm. So they won't meow. I mean, they will meow at some point. There is a threshold. But, you know, and, and of course, I'm being very general here. So 
your cat might do something completely different to mine. We've got different types of breeds and different personalities within those breeds as well. So uh, for the most part, if a cat is scared or injured uh, or sick as well, they'll just go and hide. They have a great ability to become invisible. It's like they pull their energy in and you can't see them. And for anyone that has cats out there, you'll know those times where you go to look for your cat on top of that bookcase seven times and they're not there. But on the eighth time, there they are. How did that happen? It's like, they're, they're amazing. Um, but they don't want to be seen, so they, they kind of remove themselves uh, sensitively. But, um, yeah, you know, we need to make sure that we don't sit and wait for too long because there's a lot of people that sort of think, oh, he always comes home or she always comes home. I know they don't go too far. Mm. And then 48 hours has gone by and you want to stay, you know, within a, you know, the window, whatever the window is. I'm not really sure it's like 48 or 72 hours. You want to do as much as you can within that time frame. So, yeah. And um, what about when you, when you do get the animal home? What do we need to be aware of once we do get them home? Well, you want to make sure, figure out how they got out to start with. You want to make sure that if there's any holes in fences or your gate's not deadlocked, you want to make sure that all of those things are fixed and plugged up. You, there is so much going on with stolen animals these days and there's a lot of designer dogs particularly out there where people are kind of creating these cute little um, dogs that everybody wants and they're super expensive. Um, $5,000 for a Bichon freeze. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, and those the French um, the French bulldog or the French pug or whatever it's called, mm -hmm. they're probably up there as well. But um, they're very much wanted on the on the market. You know, check Gumtree, check Craigslist, do all of those things. You know, when your when your animals go missing, there's a lot of things that you should be doing um, mm -hmm. rather than sitting around waiting. But um, yeah, the stolen animals is huge. So you want to make mm -hmm. sure. That dogs can't be seen from the front because if people are loitering um, and they see the Bichon freeze in the in the front gate there, they're you know they're probably lining you up. But we want to up. take our we want to take our animal out to go walking, like you know. So if, if someone's really on the prowl, the best way to find them is on a on the walking path, isn't it? And then just somehow follow them home in a car or. You know, I mean, we don't want yeah. it to be talking about that, but it is very sad and it's, uh, I think a lot of people, it's probably worse than what it ever has been right now because of, of people being in desperate situations. So let's not give them any ideas. <laughs> let's not focus on that. But what about, what do you feel about microchipping your animals? What's your take on that? Look, I think it's really important, you know. It's, um, the, the problem with microchipping is people get their animals microchipped but then they don't update their information. So, you know, one thing that, one thing, and this is probably different globally. I'm not too sure of all of the different regions and shires and countries and, and those sorts of things, but there are areas where when an animal goes to a vet, say, they're not scanned. So I'd like to see an animal scanned when they go to the vet mm -hmm. to make sure that that person is the owner of that animal. That's a good um, idea. Yeah, and they're not. And even, you know, animals, I, I'm not too sure of what happens with this either, but animals that have been um, unfortunately hit by a car or something like that and they're, they're on the side of the road, for those animals to be scanned as well. And so the owners can be notified. Yes, um, I know a lot but, of the councils require you to have your animal registered um, yeah. I think I think even microchipped or is it just registered yes. microchipped. Uh, well I think it's it might be different across the states and and the countries mm -hmm. so I'm not a hundred percent sure that there's a blanket answer to that but certainly um, the Shire that I was in you had to be registered and microchipped right it's a, it's an odd topic really I mean you thinking that your animal has a microchip inside it to track it, like um, would, would, would you microchip your child? 
just asking off yeah. topic. <laughs> <laughs> it is well it's a good question isn't it i mean um i guess they don't perhaps have as free reign until do they not like, do they not you know, feel i mean how, how do they feel about being microchipped i haven't asked them but that's an excellent question i might mm -hmm. ask that question and put it in the back end of this show oh i would really <laughs> love that and yeah. also um if they are microchipped why do they need you yeah a microchip is not a gps tracker. oh okay oh so, right yeah so yes so microchip doesn't actually um well you know it might be a great idea microchip doesn't give you gps coordinates as okay. animal communication getting, doesn't give i'm actually getting confused with this little thing that tracks us everywhere we go right oh yeah <laughs> yeah well there are some um i believe some collars and things that you can get that have gps trackers now i'm not too oh. sure of the success rate sure. of those and and i'm not sure animals. i'm not too sure that would be so good for their health to have that on their body 24 7 either just like it's not good for us to be carrying our mobile phones on our body yes what a shame mobile phones were invented in the first place i'm sure they've got some good points but <laughs> yeah 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 totally. well thank you for answering that question because i was thinking oh if they're microchipped we can find them you know like that's the reason you have it but it's to identify who the owner of the animal is right yes and the problem yeah. being that the owner moves house and they don't update their details mm, yes and then they're honest. not scanned when they go, you know, they go to the pound or I think the pound actually scans. But uh, the, um, you know, the vets and things, it would be great if they scanned and then, you know, then that person, if, the, if it was the actual owner, that would be an issue, but they'd need to provide proof of ownership. Yes, yes. I mean, you know, when you... Um, uh moving you're selling a house or you're buying a house the real estate agent actually gives you a checklist of all the things oh, like yes. don't forget to forward your email address maybe you yeah. can reach out to some real estate agents and actually say this is a good suggestion to put on your don't forget to update your details for your microchip if you have a pet yes absolutely because you know I've quoted this so many times, I can't even remember what it is now, but it's something like 61% of households in Australia alone, and, and it's probably a representation of other places around the world, 61% uh, of households in Australia have pets. Wow. So, you know, th there's a lot, there's a lot of cats and dogs around. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. Um, there are many pet recovery specialists out there, Romy. So... How is intuitive tracking different and what tips can you share with the viewers on how they can work with this themselves? Animal communication for missing animals is um, not hands-on. So we don't, well, you could actually, but I, from my point of view, I don't go to China and try and find that lady's cat that went missing in some big city there. Um, so the pet recovery specialists, they are, they're, there's probably not a lot of them around. Um, there's probably not enough of them around with the amount of animals going missing globally. But they have all sorts of access to people like canine trackers. They have, um, you know, they might have drones that have a thermal imaging um, cameras in them. They have access to private investigators. Um, you know, they'll have the people that do the work that you don't want to do, like knock on the doors, check the neighbour's sheds and gardens and things like that. Um, you know, do the flyers, do the emails, all of those types of things. They're really hands-on where animal communication is not hands-on. So unless you live in the area and you're out there doing that too. And, you know, it would probably be actually uh, a very useful thing to do to combine the two. But... From my point of view, I um, and I can give you an example. Sometimes examples help people um, understand things better. One of my cats went missing. I've touched on it to start with. One of my cats went missing not so long ago. And when we work intuitively, we are trying to touch into those senses that have often gone to sleep unless you're using them. So it's the inner vision 
It might be a still image that you get in your mind or a running video screen. It might be a feeling, an emotion. It might be a smell or a taste that just kind of lands in your mouth without actually eating something. Or you might hear things or you just really know that strong sense of knowing. So we touch into these other senses. And so my cat went missing and I know her behavior. This is one thing that is a good thing to pay attention to with your animals is to know where they wander off to, to know what their personality is like, to know when they come home and all those types of things. So with this, with Rizzy, she doesn't go far. She would go maximum one house either side and that's about it. She might cross over the road to that little bush area there. It's not bushes, it's just some plants and things like that. But I know that she doesn't go far and I know that she's always home and she's always in at night time. And this particular night she wasn't. So I firstly touched into that gut instinct and that is the instinct that most people that think intuition is nonsense are very strong at. Um, I wanted to know, am I worried? Should I feel worried about this cat? Uh, and I just didn't. I felt absolutely at peace. Nothing was a problem. Don't worry about it. And I know that I do this for a job, so it's actually easy for me to, to trust these instincts. When you're in crisis mode, it's not. So, you know, perhaps get someone else to, to do that for you. Um, so that was the first thing I did. Yes, I don't need to be worried. Good. I wanted to know, is she on the property, on my property? Is she in my boundaries? And what I did with that was I put a fruit. I often use fruit and veggies for yes and no answers or, or you know, if we're trying to find out who's going to win the rugby league grand final on the weekend. So I gave yes a strawberry and I gave no a banana. And I just asked, show me if Rizzy is in my, on my property. And I got the strawberry. Okay, so I was pretty confident that, and I and I felt that that was a definite yes that I didn't make it up because I wanted her to be. So you know, of course, you've got to weigh that sort of stuff up too. But it was just more information. I felt underneath her to see what were her paws touching. It felt a little rough. Okay, what is the rough? And I'm sort of kind of doing this with my own fingers, trying to feel it. It feels a little bit like wood chips or mulch or something like that. Okay, so she could be outside under one of the hedges or she could be in the garden. All right. and, but I'd been around the garden a thousand times. I'd been around the street. I'd been, you know, it's like 9 o'clock at night now and she's normally inside then. So I felt like she was alive and that she was well and that she was not at all concerned and that she was on top of something that resembled mulch or wood chips. I've gone to bed because I've checked in and it's like just... When it's light, go and search again, but you'll find her before that. I was lying in bed. It's 1 o'clock in the morning, and I thought, I'm just going to bring in her brother who passed a year or so ago now. I'm going to bring her brother in, and I'm going to see if he can help me find her. And so I've just called his name out in my mind, Jack, 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 and I've seen him in my inner vision, and I've asked him to come to me. Now, you can try this. You might think you're making it up, but, hey, it doesn't cost you anything, does it? So give it a go. So he's come to me and I said to him, help me find Rizzy. And I hear in my thoughts, in my mind, the words, go to the back hedge with the torch. And I, and I thought, all right, I'll do that. But I didn't really move very fast because it's one o'clock in the morning. And then I hear, now, you have to go now. Go to the back hedge with the torch. And so I've gone out and I'm, <laughs> I'm in my pyjamas and I'm, out in all of the hedges because there's hedges all around us and so I know the back hedge the back hedge and it's like she's not under there stop so I stopped and then I hear the meow in the garden shed now you know that thing of animals making themselves invisible I've looked everywhere a thousand times and she's not there <laughs> and here she is meow 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 but I had to go out at one o'clock in the morning when it was really still and it was really quiet so I could hear her if I'd gone in the morning when all the activities going on in the neighbourhood, I probably wouldn't have heard her and I may have not gone in the shed for the hundredth time to have a look for her. So in she comes like nothing's happened, all is well. So that's something that people can do is while you're waiting and if you feel too crisis mode to do this yourself, 
get someone else to do it with you or for you and just ask them, what do you feel under their feet? What can you smell from their nose? I could smell, um, you know, fertilizers and things like that, which is in the garden shed. What can you smell from your nose like you're the cat or the dog and that type of thing? What can you hear from the ears? I couldn't hear anything. And I was trying to see through her eyes and it was pitch black. The other thing you can do is to ask that question in a different way. Show me what I can see through her eyes during daylight, even though it's night time. Show me what I can see during the day. And I probably, I didn't do that, but I probably would have seen the lawnmower and buckets and whatever's in that shed. So there are definitely so things you, that people can do. Did you give her a stern talking to Romy? Because I know if my daughter was out to one o'clock in the morning, well, she has been and she got a very stern uh, talking to you. But did you ask your cat what she was doing and why she was out there and didn't come in earlier? Well, I think I might have called her a little rat. Um, <laughs> You naughty little rat. Well, I might have whispered at one o'clock in the morning, get inside. Um, but she's just, she's a cat. She's just being curious. Dad had gone in the shed to get the leaf blower or something like that and she'd followed him in and she'd found a nice so little So she wasn't looking spot. for a mouse or, you know? Uh, well, she wasn't. But if there was one in there, she would have had a grand old time. <laughs> Yes. Uh, as they do. Well, it's yeah. been an absolute pleasure chatting with you, Romy. I'm so even more in love with the work that you do for animals. And um, I just want to ask you, if you can get inside an animal's mind and see through their eyes, can you do that for humans as well? Yes. Wow. Can we all do when that? Because you were asking us to... To, to do that with our if our animals go missing can we do this too absolutely absolutely it's just it's a case of reawakening all of those intuitive senses that have gone into the archives now we lose that for for various reasons a we don't believe in it it's been mm -hmm. squashed out of us um we don't understand it's it, never so taught it. it's never taught to us let's face it it's not it's not you know i heard a long time ago, and I'm probably going to misquote this a little bit. Oh, actually, there is something I also want to um, mention, a study with cats because it's important. But I think it was Harvard University did a study on 104 CEO, uh, Fortune 500 CEOs and asked them, do you use intuition to make big decisions? And something like 101 said they did but don't tell anyone and the rest didn't really know so you know there's this kind of tabooness around it because it's weird it's woo woo it's you know it's not true it's just those people that wear big earrings and velvet that do this sort of stuff it is available well, I, I to think all of us the, i think i think that's the narrative that's been sold to us and told yeah. to us over and over and again but the truth is if we really find out how powerful we are, that's that's what is then suppressed. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it can make life so much easier. And I just wanted to touch on this study that was done actually at, uh, I believe, the University of Queensland back in 2017. There were 1,232 cat owners that had lost um, cats that were asked a whole series of questions. And what they found was that as the cat owners that found their cats, what they found was that the cats were, the outdoor cats were found on average around 17 house, a 17 house radius from their home base. Indoor cats was two to three houses. So, if you have a cat that goes missing, search thoroughly. They get in washing machines. They get behind washing machines. I've had a cat in a possum box or a bird box up in a tree in a schoolyard. They get in stuff you would just never consider. They get into small, tiny little hidey holes that you wouldn't even think of. So uh, the other thing that came up with this study was the number one method for finding the missing cats was a thorough, aggressive physical search of the area 
So, you know, I've had cats that have gone missing or got trapped in building sites two doors down from home. So there's a lot, there's a lot of work but that you, you can did do. You, did you find that through you looking through the pet? Yes. And, and it's not, I mean, that all sounds very simple. That sounds like, well, just show me. If I would be loaded, Mel, if if I was finding animals left, right, and centre because this was, you know, a really sharp tool, um, it would be great. I would love that, but it doesn't work as easily as it sounds. So you can well, maybe see you just need to sharpen your tool a bit more, a bit, oh, off, a look, bit more often. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it's a constant work in process, progress, of course. Like everything, yeah, yeah. But you know, it is it is available to everybody. Even if you think you're making it up, it's worth trying to see what you can find. And for Absolutely. the people that have animals that go missing that are never returned, that is absolutely heartbreaking and quite traumatic. Mm -hmm. uh, I would highly recommend seeing someone. We had a few episodes ago, Nancy Gordon, who is a pet loss and um, grief. A specialist and you know she talks about that being a sense of haunting when you just there's no closure on an animal mm -hmm. that is not returned or found uh, and mm -hmm. you need some help to kind of work through that grief process because it is a part of the grieving process and and so I'd highly recommend um, that as well and also if you find your animal go and pull your flyers down go and thank everybody that helped you <laughs> All of those things. Yes. Lots of dodgy people around too. Don't ever give your address out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of great lot advice of there. Yeah. Thank you, Romy, for sharing. It's it's been an absolute pleasure to interview you on the Animal Television Show. Oh, thank you, Mel. Thank you for coming and uh, being a part of what you created, my friend. It's a pleasure <laughs> to have you here. Don't go anywhere. The Animals Television Show will be back in just a moment. box is the segment where I get to have a chat with some of our viewers animals. Now it's not a verbal conversation like I'd ordinarily have with someone. It's a conversation using the language of animals where we transfer images, words and feelings from one to the other. I can smell on behalf of an animal. I can taste what they taste, hear what they hear. I can feel in their body what they feel. And you can gather a lot of information communicating this way from behavioural issues to emotional and mental health issues. I can taste their food and I can feel in their body where they're unwell or where they're injured. This is often referred to as animal communication. Right now, we have some animals waiting for us in the chat box. Let's go see who they are and what they've got to say to us today. Before we jump into the chat box, I want to cover off that question that Mel spoke about at the beginning of the show about how animals feel about being microchipped. It wasn't a lengthy conversation, let me tell you. What I did was I just called in the spokesperson for the dog collective and a spokesperson for the cat collective to see what they had to say about that. Now, I was a little bit surprised. The cat's conversation was quick, as you can imagine. They just agreed with everything the dog said. But the dogs were a little ticked off. They were ticked off with the humans meddling again in what is their life path or their journey. And if they were to go missing, that was what was supposed to happen. If they were to be found, that was a part of their journey. And so they're a little bit annoyed that we have these inventions that are trying to kind of change the course of nature. So he was a little bit grumpy. But what I suggested to him was that, is it not that the human's path is to be able to invent these things that can reunite you? with your owners. And we all hear about those amazing um, stories of dogs and cats that go missing for years and then they're scanned, they find the original owners and they're reunited. He was very confused about that. Well, not confused. He was contemplative, I guess. He's just, uh, he left me with a, hmm, I have to think about that uh, kind of idea. The other thing that he wanted to show me was how it actually felt to have this microchip inside them. 
If you can imagine having a splinter in your finger or your foot, it's a foreign body and you don't want it there and you can't not feel it. Until you get it out, it's just there and it's really annoying. That's how a microchip feels to a dog. It also has this feeling of electricity and I can liken the feeling to the sound. So, you know, if you've heard electricity or lights on and things like that, it's kind of got that kind of sound. That's the feeling that, that I'm showing that is a constant. So they're always feeling this. So that was kind of interesting. When I brought in the cat collective, that spokes, that spokes cat said to me pretty much, yeah, what the dog said. But then as he's turned around and stalked off, I hear these words, why do humans have to fix everything? Why do they have to have a solution for every single thing? Just let nature take its course. So that was interesting. That's an answer, Mel, for you for that question on how do animals feel about microchips. We're going to jump on into the chat box now and we're going to talk a little bit more about missing animals. Well, hello everyone. Here we are back in the chat box. We are not going to be talking to animals tonight. I want to spend a little bit more time talking about missing animals and some of the things that we should be thinking about, be mindful of, be prepared for. I can tell you that when my cat was stolen many years ago, I certainly wasn't expecting it. And I don't know that I even considered to consider that I needed to be prepared for that or that it's a good idea. There are some pretty amazing pet recovery specialists out there. They might call themselves pet detectives or missing animals investigators or some variation on that theme. But I would highly recommend that you get in contact with them if you have an animal that goes missing. They are on the ground. They do this stuff all the time. So they have the expertise. They have the contacts. They have the extras like the canine trackers and the thermal imaging drones that can be really helpful, especially if you get onto it quickly. So I want to start today by talking about the possibility, not probability, but let's say possibility of your animal going missing. And I want to talk first up about setting up a little missing animals toolbox. And you want to keep it handy and you want to keep it updated. So don't forget that part, keep it updated. In your toolbox, you want to have photos of your animal and not just their face. You want to take photos of the full animal from the front and from the side and, on, and from the side of them standing with their tail fully extended, however that looks for your animal. If they have a tail, some animals don't. You want to take photos of any markings, any scars, any interesting features that would help identify your animal. You want to make sure you have the microchip details included in your toolbox and you want to make sure that the details are updated. So if you move house or change phone number, make sure that you are updating your microchip database as well. You might even want to put a reminder in your diary every, every few months to just make sure that your microchip details have been updated. Also have a torch, have a torch available and of course with some fresh batteries because if you have an animal that goes missing, even if it's daytime, if they're going to hide in a dark hidey hole, you want to be able to use a torch to find them. They are some things to consider to have in your missing animals toolbox and you know think outside the square, put all sorts of things that you may think that might be useful there. We've already spoken in the first part of our show some of the reasons why our animals may go missing, but just to recap on some of those reasons. They may get stolen. Now this is a, just such a problem now. It's more and more prevalent. So be vigilant, especially when you're not at home with your animals. Gates may get left open. Doors may get left open and off they shoot. There may be a hole in the fence or a break in the fence somewhere that they can escape from. They may inadvertently get into someone else's vehicle and get driven off somewhere. They may get trapped. They may be injured. Unfortunately, they may end up in a traffic accident. And the thing that we don't really want to think about too much is that they may have a problem with something going on in the house, a person or a situation. So don't discount that. That happens quite often as well. They don't like it and they wander off or they want change and they wander off until that happens. 
So they're some of the reasons why our animals go missing, which leads me on to what should we do if our animal goes missing. You want to do a thorough physical search of your house, your property and your area. And that includes knocking on your neighbor's doors and asking to look through all of their cupboards, sheds, boxes, under their decks, in their roofs, behind things, under things, on top of things, every nook and cranny that you can possibly think about plus a bit. And don't go waltzing through your neighbor's backyard, by the way, without their permission. So make sure that you speak to them first before you go in there. You want to get people to help you. You want to print off flyers. Remember your toolkit because you've got all those photos in there, remember? Print off flyers and hang them around, get them onto your community notice boards, uh, intersection poles. You know, you need to remember what is legal in your area too, where you can hang things. And this is where your pet recovery specialists can really help you in your area because they know what you can and can't do. You want to get onto all of the Facebook lost and found groups. You want to set up a page for your animal and share it around and get everybody else to share it around. Contact all the vets in your area. Contact your local pound or your shire. As I mentioned before, make sure your microchip details are up to date. You can bring in canine trackers and if you have your pet recovery specialist working with you, they may have canine trackers as a part of their team. If there are things that you don't want to do, again, find your nearest pet recovery specialist and have them do it for you. There's so many people that don't like knocking on their neighbor's doors. I have to say, I'm not really very comfortable with it either, but I would do it if I needed to. Check your local papers, check Gumtree, check Craigslist, all those, um, all those papers and online selling websites uh, in your area. Tag your car with fluorescent pen. You can get the fluorescent pens that you can wash off. You can have all your phone numbers and who's gone missing and that type of thing on there. Just coming back to Facebook, make sure also that you check your email spam folder and your messenger requests. You know, messenger requests, if it's not from a friend, you don't always get notified that you have a request in there. So if you've got someone missing and you've got a Facebook page for them, someone may be trying to contact you. So make sure you get in there. So many dodgy people and scam artists out there. Make sure you don't put your address on anything. And if you are meeting someone because I've told you they have your dog, cat, whatever, make sure you've got someone with you and that you meet in a neutral public place. Don't, get, don't let them come to your house. This is not so much what you should do if your animal goes missing, but just know that people describing an animal over the phone may not even be close. The last thing that I want to go through with you are just some additional ideas and thoughts that you may want to consider during your search. When you transport your animals, make sure they're in a carrier. And if your dog's on a seat, make sure they're attached in some way. If you're in an accident or if someone just randomly comes up and opens the door, they can bolt and never to be seen again. And not to mention that they may run into traffic, which we definitely don't want that to happen. If you're taking your dog for a walk off lead, you want to make sure that they're trained to come when you call them. You want to keep your gates deadlocked and make sure that your dogs aren't seen from the front of the house or the front of the um, driveway. You want to do a perimeter scan of your yard and make sure there's no holes in fences. And if there are, make sure that you fix them. If your animal has been stolen and you do find the person or the people that have your animal, you'll need some legal advice here. So I would contact your pet recovery specialists who probably know the lay of the land from a legal standpoint in your area. The last thing I want to mention here is that our animals most often don't behave in the same way they would at home when they're lost or missing. So if you see them on the street, don't yell or clap or whistle or chase them because they'll bolt and you'll be back at square one again. They'll be in that fight flight mode where the blood leaves the brain and they can't think. And also the, um, their sense of smell goes as well. So if you think that they might smell you or if you have food with you that they would recognize, they may not recognize that. So stay calm, move slowly, sit down, lie down. Don't make eye contact. Just look at your dog through the corner of your eye. Eye contact with the dog will often make them feel like they're being dominated and then they'll run. And again, you'll be back at square one.
It's certainly not an easy time when our animals go missing. They're a part of the family, they're, they're in the heart. So it's very stressful and a very traumatic and difficult time for everybody. And particularly when our animals go missing and we don't find them and we have no closure. As I mentioned in the first part of the show, I highly recommend getting in touch with someone like Nancy Gordon, a pet loss and grief specialist that can help you through that part of the grief process. Stay optimistic, stay hopeful and keep searching. That's the end of our show everyone. Thank you again for joining me. Don't forget, subscribe to the YouTube channel, press on that little bell so you get notified of the upcoming shows and follow the pages, Instagram, Facebook, the website. Share the love with all your animal loving family and friends. Thank you again for watching. I'm Romy Bueller. The Animals Television Show will be back on again soon. Welcome, everyone. <laughs> oh, God, everything's just dry today. To, how am I supposed to keep a straight face when you do that? I'm oh, sorry. Let me just try a different alternative. <laughs> oh, is it happening?